everyone. So today we're going to define uh, yet another complex function, which is going to be uh, kind of the complex version of the natural logarithm function. But uh, first let me recall some stuff from last time about the exponential function, because we're going to need to understand the exponential function in order to understand the logarithm. So um, recall, so we've got this complex function that I'm calling x of z, and it's kind of the complex version of, of e to the x, but now we're allowing the inputs to be complex numbers. And it's defined as follows, so if, if I break z into its real and imaginary parts, that's the easiest way to define x of z, it's going to be equal to uh, e to the x times cosine y plus i sine y. And um, you checked on your homework that this function satisfies uh, most of the usual properties. Or maybe I'll say it satisfies the kind of the same properties as the real valued function e to the x that that we like to use, like the derivative of this function is itself, for instance. Um, okay, and what I'd like to do is, I don't know if I really talk too much about this, uh, is, is talk about kind of what this looks like if we graph this function. So notice here, um, if I try to graph x of z, Let's say, let's say this is x of z for some z, then um, its real part is right here. It's e to the x times cosine y. And so the x-coordinate of this function is e to the x cosine y. And um, then the imaginary part is e to the x times sine y. So that's that's the distance of this vertical line. And this this gives us an idea of where this where this point x of z is in space because we can easily say um, in polar coordinates what what this looks like. So uh, notice here that um, by the Pythagorean theorem, uh, we know what this is, and the hypotenuse, so it's going to be the square root of this squared plus that squared, but using the fact that cosine y squared plus sine of y squared equals 1, this is going to simplify. And so um, the modulus of this point x of z is just e to the x. So I'll write that. And furthermore, um, if you think about it a little bit, the way we're defining this triangle, you can check using trig identities that this angle here is y. So if I think of y as an angle, um, then it's, it's going to be exactly the angle of this triangle. And another way of saying that is that the argument of x of z is just equal to y, which is the imaginary part of our input. Okay, and so if I express z in terms of rectangular coordinates, I can easily say what x of z is in terms of polar coordinates. It's got modulus equal to e to the x, which notice is always a positive number. e to the x um, as a real valued function, its outputs are always positive. And its argument is just equal to y, if I think of y as, as an angle. So one thing that tells us is if I modify y to y plus 2 pi, that's not going to change uh, the argument at all, because that just means I've gone around the circle one more time. And so I end up with the same point. And what that's saying is if I add 
2 pi to the imaginary part, in other words, I add 2 pi times i to z, then exp of z remains the same. And so this tells us that exp of z is equal to exp of z plus 2 pi in the imaginary direction, so plus 2 pi i. And so as opposed to the real exponential function, um, exp of z is not an injective function. It's not one-to-one. -one. There's multiple inputs that give me the same output. Um, and in fact, uh, we can say more. We can say it's periodic. And its period is 2 pi i. And that just means exactly what I wrote here. That If I add 2 pi i to the input, it doesn't change the output. Um, now this presents a problem if we're trying to define the logarithm because uh, if, we, if we try to do what we did with real valued functions, we would define the logarithm, the natural logarithm of x just to be the inverse of e to the x, right? So if we're working with real functions, with real functions, um, we define the logarithm of x to be the inverse function of e to the x. But we can't do that here. Oh, so what does inverse mean? It just means that if I take the composition of these two, I get back to where I started, right? Um, and so we, we, if we want to define a complex logarithm, we want to do the same thing. The complex function x of z. But this is not possible. Um, why? Well, because, for instance, um, if x of z equals w, then x of z plus 2 pi i also equals w. Um, and so if I write, um, if I let f of z just be another label for x of z, then, then if I want to say, okay, what is the inverse evaluated at w? Well, x of z is equal to w, so the inverse should send w to z. But x of z plus 2 pi i is also equal to w. So then I would say, or, you know, it could be z plus 2 pi i could be z plus any multiple of 2 pi i, really, like 5, for instance, et cetera. So there's, there's no unique choice for what, the in, for, for what the inverse function should do to an input w because there's many inputs to the x function that give the same w. OK, now if you remember how we defined the inverse of the cosine function or the inverse of the sine function, um, for 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 real valued functions, um, you know we had the same issue there. Cosine's not one to one. Sine's not one to one. Uh, the only thing we can do is restrict the domain of our function to a region where it is one to one, and then the inverse is defined. So the solution to this problem, if we want to, you know, if we really really want to define an inverse to the x function is we need to restrict the domain. And the thing is there's lots of ways to do this. Um, so let me, sorry, let me finish my thought. We want to restrict the domain of x of z so that it is one-to-one -one on that domain. And if we think of the function just on that restricted the, on that restricted domain, then it is 
possible to define it in years. Uh, but we have many ways to do this. For inverse cosine and inverse sine, uh, usually what you do is you just choose choose one way of doing it once and for all. You choose a single restricted domain, and you go with that forever. Um, it turns out in complex analysis, we're not necessarily going to do that, but there is one choice that comes up most often. So I'm going to define a new function, which is just the exponential, but on a restricted domain. So I'm going to give it a new name. So I'll call it f. And it's, it's going to be equal. So f of z is going to be equal to x of z on the domain of f. So it's defined just to be the exponential function, but, but it's, its domain is going to be smaller than the whole exponential function. So what I want to do is restrict to some domain where the exponential function is one to one. And that's not hard to do. I mean, the problem, the problem with the one to oneness comes from adding two pi i. So if I make sure the imaginary part doesn't have two points in it that differ by two pi i, I'll be okay. And so one way to do this is to force the imaginary part to be between negative pi, so this just means imaginary part of z, to be between negative pi and pi. And so, so if, again, if this is x plus i, y, the imaginary part is just the coefficient of i, so it's y here. So I'm forcing y to be between negative pi and pi, and not including negative pi. And the exponential function is 1 to 1 on there, so I'll be okay. And then where does this function go? Well, it goes to the complex numbers. But um, I want to be a little more precise. It, it never hits 0. So it actually goes to the complex numbers minus the origin. And why is that? Well, because the, the modulus of the exponential function is e to the x, and e to the x is never 0. So, so we're always getting outputs whose modulus is non-zero, which means they're not the origin. Okay, um, so the point is that I've, I've restricted the domain. Um, f has this limited domain. Maybe it's worth graphing it, just so we have a nice visual here. Um, so what is this region? It's all points whose imaginary part, that's the y-coordinate, is greater than pi. So I'm drawing a dashed line because it's not including pi. And, or sorry, greater than minus pi, and less than pi, less than or equal to pi. So it includes pi. And so it's this, it's this horizontal strip here. And the output Here's the function f. The, the output is never 0, but other than that, it can be anything. Why can it be anything? How do I know that? Well, I can get any possible modulus, uh, because that's just coming from, from um, looking at e to the x. So I can get any positive value for e to the x, because I'm, I'm not restricting x which means I can get any positive modulus here. Modulus is always positive anyway. And then the argument of these outputs are just the imaginary part. So the arguments are always between negative pi and pi, which means you know I can go up to an argument of pi, or I can go back to anything that's less than minus pi. So here's Here's argument pi, here's argument minus pi. And that's giving me all the complex numbers. Any positive modulus and argument between negative pi and pi gives me every possible output, except the origin. 
and you know one way to think of what this is doing is it's kind of um, well somehow this strip is getting stretched out and sort of wrapped around um, wrapped around the origin and this line right here gets mapped exactly to points with argument pi so it gets mapped to the blue line which is the negative x-axis in the output. Okay. Now, what I was going to do is define the inverse of this function. And so this is known as the principal logarithm. And the word principal just means um, that it's, it's the one we use most often in the sense that, remember I made a choice of how to restrict my domain, this is the choice that is most common in complex analysis. So we'll define the principal logarithm to be the inverse to this function f. And so the domain is, is defined on all non-zero complex numbers, so c minus the origin. And its outputs are complex numbers, um, technically, complex numbers, uh, yeah, I mean, technically, it's, it's just this region. Because, of course, the, the image of f inverse is exactly the, the domain of f, right? Um, and some notation, so we'll denote this function. log. Um, I, know, I know that in previous classes you may have seen this notation used to mean the log base 2. We're not using that notation. That's not what this means. This just means the inverse of the complex exponential function where I've restricted the domain um, as, as I described. So let me just write this. As log. Okay, so log, um, by the way, the book doesn't do a very good job, I think, in this section. They have many different, you know, they have a log, they have a log, they have a recursive log. I think it's a little confusing, um, but whenever they have non-cursive with a capital letter, they mean this one that I've just defined. Uh, Okay, so this, this is kind of the most important one to remember, and by the way, it's, it's not very hard to find a formula for this function. We just use the fact that it's the inverse to the exponential, so if w is equal to exp of z, um, for some z equals x plus i y, and remember, we're only looking at this restricted domain where y is between negative pi and pi. So I'm restricting to some z satisfying this condition. Then, what do we know about the exponential function? We know that the modulus of w is equal to e to the x. That's what the exponential function does. And we know that the argument of w is just equal to the imaginary part of z, so it's equal to y. And the first equation here tells us how to find x. x is just the natural log. You know, it's, it's the inverse to this function, the real valued exponential function that inverse is natural log. So x is natural log of the modulus of w. Does this make sense? Well, natural log is only defined for positive real numbers, but that's exactly what modulus gives us. For complex w, modulus is positive and real, or non-negative and real, I should say. Um, 
but of course we're restricting our domain so that w is non-zero. So ln of modulus of w makes sense. And then argument of w is just equal to y, so that, that tells us um, well, that tells us how to solve for y in terms of w. So we can solve for x and y in terms of w, which is exactly what we need for an inverse function. So this tells me that if I want to define log of w, then its real part, so, so if w equals x of z, then log of w equals z, right? And so um, the real part is x here. So the real part of log of w is x, which is natural log of the modulus of w. And the imaginary part is y, but that's the argument. Okay. And the point is, this, this argument, argument means an angle, right? Argument's an angle. Um, and you have many choices for how to represent an angle, right? The angle 0 is the same as the angle 2 pi, is the same as the angle 4 pi, etc. But because we restricted our domain, for, for this argument to give us the right value of y, we need it to lie inside this range. So here we're defining this angle to be in the interval between negative pi and pi, including pi and not including negative pi. Right, so, so any angle uh, can be expressed as something in that interval, and that's the interval we're going to use to define this principal logarithm function. And this is exactly where the ambiguity comes in, because this argument, you know, you have many choices for how to represent angles. Um, different choices correspond to looking at different domains of the exponential function and taking the inverse on a different domain. So again, this, this log function now, we're looking at the complex numbers minus the origin, and I'm thinking of my arguments as lying somewhere between pi and minus pi, and I'm drawing this blue line here because something special is going on here. This is exactly where the argument jumps, right? So, you know, if I'm looking at the log of z for a bunch of points, maybe I'll go the other way. If I'm looking at a sequence of points, do to do to do, or like a path here, right? The argument is getting more and more negative, more and more negative, closer and closer to minus pi, which means the imaginary part of the log function is getting closer and closer to minus pi. But as soon as I hit this blue line, it jumps to pi because on the blue line I declare the argument to be pi rather than minus pi since I'm choosing it to lie in this interval. And what that means is this function log is not continuous on the blue line. Not continuous on um, the set of points w equals u plus iv where v is 0 and u is negative, right? That's how I can describe the, the blue line. Um, okay, and then, and then since we're declaring the angles to be the arguments here be, to be between negative pi and pi, then that's saying the outputs have imaginary part between negative pi and pi, which is just saying, again, that the image of this log function is equal to exactly the domain of, the restricted domain of the exponential function that I chose before. Okay. Um, by the way, so some, some terminology uh, which hasn't appeared in our textbook yet, but comes up 
it'll come up uh, more if you keep doing complex analysis. This is called the branch cut. And, and it's exactly where our function log is not continuous. And so I guess what I'm saying is, if you want to define an inverse to the exponential function, the formula for it is always the same. It's always exactly this formula. But the choice that you make is, these are angles, because they're arguments, right? And you get to say where these angles lie. You could say, like we did, that they lie between negative pi and pi. That gives you a way of representing all angles. Uh, but you could just as easily make a different choice. You could say, oh, I'm going to have mine. Uh, I, want, I want my angles to always be written as something between 0 and 2 pi. And that's a perfectly valid choice as well. Um, and that'll give you a slightly different function because the outputs now have imaginary part between 0 and 2 pi rather than between negative pi and pi. So let me write that down. You could just as easily have chosen your angles when you when you write arg arg of w that's an angle you could chosen have chosen your angles uh, to be um, in a different interval maybe from 0 to 2 pi right that's kind of the usual way we write angles and that gives you a different function so let's Let's call this function, um, this is, this is non-standard, I'm just making this up, but maybe I call it log with a hat on top. And log hat of w has a formula that looks exactly the same uh, for complex number w. The output is going to be real part ln of modulus of w and imaginary part argument of w. But now I'm declaring this argument to be in the range from 0 to 2 pi. And if I do that, then again I get a function from c minus the origin to some subset of the complex numbers. And now when I look at angles, I always choose them to be somewhere between 0 and 2 pi. And so the place where my function is not continuous now is going to be exactly where it jumps, right? So now if I have some points here, their angle is closer and closer to 2 pi, closer and closer to 2 pi, but then here it jumps down to 0. And then it gets more and more positive again. So this function now is, is not continuous. Um, this log hat function is not continuous on the positive real axis. And another way to say this is I've chosen a different branch cut. Uh, previously we chose a branch cut to be the negative real axis. Here we're choosing it to be the positive real axis. And it's just it's just uh, a choice of where what angles you want your argument to be. And now you can see that the outputs have imaginary part anywhere between 0 and 2 pi, not including 2 pi. So the outputs look like that. And so log hat is a different inverse also an inverse to x to the exponential function but the difference is um, it's an inverse to again restricting the domain of this exponential function to something here I've restricted the domain of the exponential function to all z equals x plus iy 
where now y I'm restricting it to be between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, and so this is just as valid as the one we did before. Um, it's, you know, it's just as good of an inverse function as the other. It just depends kind of where, really it depends on where you're looking at your exponential function. If you're looking at exponential function with imaginary values between 0 and 2 pi, this is probably the better inverse to choose. If you're looking at exponential function on the domain with imaginary values between negative pi and pi, then this is the better one to choose. Um, but but this, this one, again, is, is called the principal logarithm, and that means that's the one we're normally going to look at. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I just want to emphasize that we made a choice in defining that. You can check using um, rules of, of derivatives of inverse functions. that the principal logarithm, and, and any other logarithm, log or log hat, doesn't really matter, um, is, so it's, it's not even continuous on the branch cut. So it's, it's not very well behaved right here. But everywhere else is continuous and differentiable. And so that means it's holomorphic on the region away from the branch cut. So on the region, um, what's the best way to say it? Well, z equals x plus i y. Well, I don't know the best way to say it. On Ah. on all z equals x plus i y except except when y equals 0 and x is less than or equal to 0 so that's the branch cut so everywhere except there I have a holomorphic function and uh, using rules of derivatives of inverse functions you can check that ddz of log z so you can guess, you can kind of hope what it would be, and it's exactly what you would hope. It's, it's the same as the derivative um, of the real logarithm. Okay, I think I'll leave it there.